The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. You know, every now and then I would stay pregnant long enough to just get a check uh, and on the 1st and the 15th and then go abort the child. And so now I was just going to make it my life pattern. And I lived there three and a half years watching my life spiral into a little dark hole. Uh, and that's where God found me. Knowing firsthand the trap of the welfare system, Star Parker has dedicated her life to loving the poor and fighting poverty. As a political activist, she helps undergird and encourage communities to do the same. Next on Life Today. Welcome to Life Today. I'm James Robinson. Betty and I are thrilled to have a real star. I mean, she's a star, and her name is Star. And as far as I'm concerned, she's a bright and morning star. She's so much like Jesus in so many ways uh, that it's, uh, it's quite amazing. Star Parker is, I think, a transformed person that really came from uh, kind of a background like I had. We're different colors, but we had a, a lot of similarities. Would you welcome Star Parker to Life Today? She's been here several times with us. We're crazy about her. Yeah. Star, uh, you know, I'm the product of a forced sexual relationship with a 40-year-old woman. Conceived me. Doctor wouldn't abort me. I'm born. Lived in poverty for 10 years, about as bad as it gets. Lived on a dump, dirty river. You know, I just, uh, I was poor. But nobody was cruel enough or foolish enough to tell me that somebody owed me and needed to take care of me. And out through all the misery, I did see possibilities. And I felt like work was not a bad word. <laughs> I guess I'd considered the birds. They get up early and they go to work, but they don't worry. I went to work at 12. It wasn't bad for me. I wasn't too young. Thank God there wasn't some smart politician telling me I was too young to work and that you were a criminal if you let a 12-year-old work. Shut up. Forever, as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. Just shut up. Find another place to go spout off where nobody can hear you. I went to work. I'm 74. I've never stopped. And I'm telling you, I've been blessed and I've been a blessing to bless others. And I love people and I help people. You didn't have a real good start yourself, did you? Well, actually, I lost track um, and I got lost uh, because uh, I did believe those lies. I did hear those lies. I heard mm -hmm. that my problems were somebody else's fault. I heard that I was poor because the wealthy were wealthy. I heard that because I was black, I shouldn't mainstream. And in listening to all those lies, I got very, very lost. I started living in um, daily activities of anything that someone asked me to do. So everything from criminal activity to drug activity to sexual activity. Uh, in and out of abortion clinic after clinic. It wasn't until after the fourth time I went into one of their so-called safe, legal, rare clinics that I just had a gut instinct way down deep inside that there must be something wrong with killing your offspring. Mm. And I didn't change any of my sexual patterns, so I was pregnant again within a very short period of time, and that's when I went on welfare to stay. Uh, I had been in and out of the system already. That's how I paid for all those abortions the government did. Um, but also, um, you know, every now and then I would stay pregnant long enough to just get a check uh, and on the 1st and the 15th and then go abort the child. And so now I was just going to make it my life pattern. And I lived there three and a half years watching my life spiral into a little dark hole. Uh, and that's where God found me. There's some Christian people that um, they told me my lifestyle was unacceptable to God. <laughs> and I suppose it was. I didn't know anything about God. Uh, <laughs> but they did keep uh, calling me to go to church with them. And when I went to church, I heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. I heard that God was in Christ, that he was reconciling the world to himself, that he wasn't counting my sin against me, that he loved me, and that he died for me, and uh, that he had a life for me. So I said, wow, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> so I kind of changed. How old were you then? Oh, I was well into my 20s probably. Yeah, you changed your life. Yeah, I just started making new decisions, started going to church. I started reading the Bible and found out that um, it worked. I mean, it really was good news. You think that a lot of people have bought the lie that you were, were living? Yeah, not only have they bought it, the challenge that we're confronted with today is it, the lies are now politicized. So not only are people buying the lies, uh, but it's taken a hold of their life even when they are Christians. I mean, uh, look into my community. I work in um, policy reform today. I run a, a policy institute in Washington, D.C. And... 
you know, people have bought this idea of collectivism and political correctness. So what's happened is if you even speak truth, uh, you're, you're called out of your name and you make a lot of enemies and end up uh, with death threats. Yeah. Uh, so that's a How lot of my life today. That? How come you're happy about all that? Why am I happy yeah. about it? Because well, the truth is on our side. And I, and I still work in uh, the grassroots. I still go into the housing projects. I, I speak for uh, probably 20 pregnancy care centers a year. And so those that are rolling up their sleeves and getting to work done in the local communities uh, for the people that are in need. I, I just know that God is a good God, so I'm very happy about it. I mean, I'm not happy about the death threats, so, sure. but I, you know. But, but you're happy about <laughs> the life you're living, okay? Yeah. Do you believe that buying into the welfare system is, is in many ways death and bondage to the people? And do you believe that it perpetuates an inappropriate power base that's actually, in fact, manipulating and using the people to maintain their position to the demise and, and damage of the very people they're trying to help or say they're trying to help. I absolutely know it's true. One thing we need to know is less than 20 cents on a dollar out of the $900 billion that we spend every year in these anti-poverty programs, less than 20 cents on a dollar actually reaches the home. 20 cents out of the dollar. That we say we want to help. All the rest is bureaucracy. I also know we've put 24 trillion dollars into this war on poverty, and the poverty rate hasn't changed at all. No, it's it hadn't. still 25% population. And the poor are getting worse with But you know what? Be well, because we collapse family. I mean, the rules of Uncle Sam are don't work, don't save, don't get married. We'll kind of keep you enslaved to this poverty plantation. But you know what else I know? The scripture said, render to Caesar what's Caesar, and to God what's God. Charity doesn't belong in a one-size-fits-all program. Charity belongs to the church. It belongs to local community, people that can look in your eye and talk to you about your life and try to help you recover. Because the poverty might not be economic. It might be spiritual. It could be just emotional. So we need to be able to look at the uniqueness of the Lord. When Jesus uh, talked about the poor, he said preach the gospel to them. How do we go set up this one-size-fits-all government program that doesn't even allow you to preach the gospel to the poor? <laughs> no, so it's never going to work. They'll fire you or fine oh, you. Oh, it's, it's incredible. When I wrote my casework and said I was leaving because, um, you know, I'd gone to church and heard this stuff, she called me and cursed me out and told me I'd be back. When Jesus was confronted with poverty, when he saw all those homeless people out there, and a lot of them were hungry, he didn't say, send them to the Romans and have them set up a food stamp program. He told his disciples, bring them to me. He, and then they're like, well, what are we supposed to do with them? He said, you're supposed to feed them. And then he multiplied. And I just know now so much of the scripture that God has already taken care of people by telling the church to, if they bring their tithes and their offerings into the, into the church, that they, will ha they have meat. We have a lot of programs in the private sector sector that are really helping people recover. They just don't have the finances to do it more, to be able to look people in the eye and, and, and talk to them about their lives. Well, because so much of it has gone to the government in excessive taxation and useless meetings, it's it's ineffective crazy. taxation, and we've allowed it to happen. Well, not only and that, we the just welfare department is on Independence Avenue. You talk about the mockery of the government. How do you put a welfare office on Independence Avenue? <laughs> you know, it's just like, they don't want you independent at all. <laughs> it's, like, it's just like mad. But, it, but things are different now. Uh, the new president is serious about making changes to fix the inner cities. He said it during the campaign. Um, blacks, he told them, what do they have to lose? They didn't buy it. Uh, and so about 8%, a couple of million voted for him. But then, unlike other politicians, he said it again in his, in his inaugural. Uh, so people started thinking, maybe he's serious. Maybe he really is going to start looking at how to help poor people and fix the inner cities. Uh, he's a builder. The guy wants to fix stuff. And so then he said it in his State of the Union last year. Uh, and so since that time, my organization, Cure, and others have been working with his administration to try to shape new ideas uh, so that we can help fix what it's broken down in our most vulnerable zip codes. Uh, he's very serious about getting this done, and we might even see some changes this year. Do you think many of the people in poverty think they can't be fixed, and so they just kind of settle into that life? Yeah. That it, we know it for a fact. And it's interesting. It's not only that they know it, they've been told it over and over and over again. You know, one of my friends, he's from another country, asked me one day, he said, you know what I understand about your folk star? I said, what? He said, why do they tell their children they're poor? He said, that's so cruel. Who would tell their children they're poor? 
And it, we've, it's perpetuation to where mm -hmm. now I went into Alabama recently and some teachers confronted me. They're like, oh, so you run a think tank? And I said, yeah, I run a think tank in Washington. Said, well, you need to go up there and think about this because this is what we're hearing now from our 14-year-olds. They're saying, mama said, don't bring home a B on your test. Mama said, bring home a baby. And mama said, if you don't bring home a baby, you're going under mm -hmm. your uncle because you're going to have a baby. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's entrenched. We've got to, we've got a cancer. And, uh, and now it's stolen all dignity from the people. And so they don't, they really don't believe that, that they have a talent, that God was a distributor of talents. And that's another reason we got to get the government out of doing charity work. That's why you want to work with the established charities in the communities. Every community has them. Somebody's working with the homeless. Someone is working, from a Christian perspective, mm -hmm. someone's working with the orphan and the foster, with, the, with, with every single place we see challenges. And so what we need are churches to adopt up those places. We need people to bring their tithes into the storehouse, and we need charity tax credits. Uh, the government should not have this system to where we send all that money to Washington, and then Washington trickles it back to the people. They should be able to give dollar to dollar uh, to the charity of their choice. And oversight. Well, the charity compassion itself oversight. has uh, compassionate oversight. When you think about, let's just take one example, the homeless shelters, the union missions. These folks, they're Christian people. They bring their tithe, their talent, their treasures. Um, they're free people. They're working with free people. But their attitude about the poor is that they're uniquely made in the eyes of God. They look at them as human beings. Their, their humanity is there. So what they're trying to do to them is get them well. They mm -hmm. know that there's mm -hmm. something that they can do. Not like the government where they just want them mm -hmm. comfortable in their state of affairs, but to have them change. So when we know that these services are available in our communities and we help them, they can help more people. You're absolutely right. You don't want to try to take it on your own and just chip them a dollar. Because if you do that or you give them a quarter on the corner, they're going to stay in that state of affair and they're going to die in that state of affair. Uh, you're just postponing the inevitable. But if you work with even the pregnancy care centers, I mean, these folks are doing really, really incredible work all across the country. So it's not that people are not benevolent and that they don't have compassion. They just don't know what to do because the government's been in this war on poverty for 50 years. And so it, they, it, actually Uncle Sam has said, don't worry about it. We'll kind of take care of it. And now everyone's looking at, uh, you didn't do really a good job, but we don't know how to get ourselves out they of this. They compound bit. the problem and they multiply the issues. That's right. It's, it's just that you and I both had a very very difficult uh, background, right. but we had a transformation in our right, heart, right, and right. we didn't believe the lies, and right. we went to work. We're trying to help other people do it. Right. The, one of the reasons that I'm telling you that this is really the truth, I can show people real serious problems here in America, mm -hmm. as serious as you'll see overseas, but it's very difficult to get American people to give to it. You want to know why? I already gave. I gave. Well, that, I gave. They, and this they is their did. mind. Yeah, they gave, but they it didn't did. work. But well, they, and, but they there's something else going themselves. on too. But there's something else going on too. They don't understand America. They don't understand why is it that we allow such large percentage of people to not contribute. When you start thinking about our broken communities, uh, their politicians and their leaders keep telling them you don't have to. This country is stacked against you. They're against all three of the the founding seas. They're against Christianity. They're against capitalism. And they're against our constitution. So they keep. <laughs> <laughs> pushing to these people that, no, don't do dare try. Don't you dare. So that's the reason that then other Americans have attitudes, because they're like, if I can get up and go to work on Monday morning, why aren't you getting up and yeah. going to work on Monday morning? You know, we just um, had some major changes uh, in Washington with Medicaid, for instance. Uh, this administration has decided to lax the rules a little bit, give a little bit more flexibility for the states to uh, put work requirements if you're going to be on Medicaid. Yeah. The, 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 the activists, they're having fits. The left <laughs> is coming apart. And all we're saying is, why can't they go to work? Yeah. You know, someone, well, they have three children. What do you expect them to do? Uh, open a daycare? They already have three children. <laughs> you know, let's teach them how to open a daycare. Yeah. They've got three, bring in three more. You know, so we, yeah, it, that's why people don't help because in our country, there really aren't any excuses. When you go and do your work abroad, they, they have nothing. Here, we have opportunity. What we've done, though, is we've allowed government to go places it shouldn't go. We've trapped our certain kids in failing government schools to where all they hear is secular humanism and big government. We won't allow them out. 39 states actually have amended their constitutions that the money can't follow the children to the schools the parents want. When poor people get a voucher, educational voucher, they actually go to 
religious schools. They yep. go to Catholic schools more often than not because they know their lives are in trouble and they know that their children need they that discipline. They, they want school choice and they want the voucher. They want to be That's absolutely go. right. Same thing with our housing programs. The HUD programs, you, we trap them in ghettos that are over, overrun with, with crime. Let them go live anywhere. You know, when you think about the food stamp program, the government didn't go into the grocery store business. Um, not that they probably didn't try, but the, um, <laughs> but, but, but in housing, they went into that business. And no, it's seriously, education they went in that business is mad what we're doing so mm -hmm. that's why we're trying to change things in DC and now uh, you said why am I happy about it? it's because we have a new administration that seems to understand uh, that the way we've been doing business for the last 50 years has not worked uh, in particular for the weakest link um, you know when I think about that little lost sheep when Jesus maybe went and went to find a little lost sheep I would think about okay so what were the other 99 doing while he was running around looking for the one you know I heard one pastor say you know where he went to look first the last time he knew he had a hundred I'm like, well, that's a good idea, kind of like your keys. You go, when's the last time I had them? But the 99, what were they doing? And I start thinking, you know, they probably were talking to each other about how secure they felt that if they got lost, he would go look for them. And so it built that dignity and that worth in those other little sheep uh, to follow the master and follow the shepherd when he returned. So, yeah, what we've done is a real disservice to our poor and to those that are now generationally trapped in our impoverished zip codes, uh, but we're changing things. And my organization is at the forefront of helping those things get changed. We're, we've, yeah. Yeah. we've kept them helpless and hopeless that's right. instead of offering them hope. That's exactly right. That's out. exactly yeah. that's ex that's very well mm -hmm. said. Trapped them in trapped them in bondage, yeah, another form yeah. of slavery and in hopeless, prison. And it's just not fair to them. Well what we've done is not working. Yeah. And you you named the trillions of dollars. Was it twenty four trillion you said? In the war, the whole war. But it's nine hundred billion a year, just the federal. A year. A yeah, year. Right it's here. a quarter of the budget. A quarter. We have a four trillion dollar economy uh, in Washington to govern. A quarter. It's like the wheel and the cars just keep turning, turning. Honey, we're not getting out of this until yeah. we share that tire. Well, we're not going to get out of it until we return to sound thinking and principles. Yeah. And it will be built on love. But you're going to have to bring these free spenders and these people that manipulate and keep people dependent. You're going to have to get them out of office. I really do believe that we just need to change things in Washington by changing the thinking and the people and those who are thinking That's wrong right. you need and get men people in who will That's think right. right. That's right. It's absolutely critical. And by the way, a lot of Christians who love the Lord, they don't think well. They don't no. have wisdom. They don't lead well. Right. And, right. and they, right. they join the, the collectivist mentality, right. the secular, right. progressive, right. socialist mentality, yeah, which is proved to fail throughout history, and yet we That's seem right. committed to continuing the process of failure. Right. Right. And it, it creates more misery per square inch than any way you can do it. Uh, Star, we're going to work together, you and I, as every way we can. Mm -hmm. We're going to encourage people to pray. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's possible? Do you think the stage is set now for us to actually make serious correction? Oh, I absolutely do. There are quite a few things. First of all, the president is taking on welfare reform in a few initiatives, and then so is the Congress. Uh, uh, Speaker Paul Ryan came to Washington just for this moment uh, in history. Uh, God called him years and years ago. He to deal correctly with welfare. And try just to, to get it out of Washington and get it back to the local communities where it belongs. Let people engage in the lives of the absolutely. poor again. Yes. And so there's a commitment there, uh, and now it's just a matter of doing it. Let's face it, now we have, so, it's it's massive, and so it's, we didn't get here yesterday. We won't get out tomorrow. Uh, but it is there is a lot of energy to try to get it done. Do you bear witness and say thanks mm -hmm. for what Star is saying, believing that if we'll adjust our thinking yeah. and our hearts, it'll correct our direction. You change the laws, you've changed lives. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, God bless you. And uh, she doesn't have a book. What is your website if people wanted to support you in whatever God puts before you? My website is urbancure.org, just urbancure.org, or they can uh, just look up Star Parker and they'll find me. And I've written a few books, but I've got a new one coming out later yeah. this year. You're going to have me back on it? I will. Oh, oh goody. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Hey, you already got the invitation now. Just oh, let us know, okay? I just invited myself. Yeah, you don't even have to wait for the publisher to that. You got it, all right? In front of the whole world, you got the invite. Oh, thank you. And I want to help you do what God puts well, on your we heart. Are and I believe our viewers org, do. And we are a 501c3 nonprofit, yeah. so I appreciate got that. It. That means you can help her and get a tax credit until the government loses their ever-loving mind and makes it even worse. <laughs> and they don't have far to go, do they? Right now, we're swinging back right. Yeah. Uh, Star, we help people all over the world. Yeah, you know you this. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you something that will touch your heart. Look, I want you to look in here. I want you to listen to a little girl 
talking to a very gifted, wonderful Christian woman, Sheila Walsh. I want you to listen close. Listen with your heart. There's some things that you can't unsee or stories you can't unhear and honestly that you, you would not want to. I've seen things on this trip that are worse than anything I could imagine. I just spent some time with a, a little girl who is now 11 and she's been forced to have sex with men, with strangers. Sunday's four a night since she was nine years old. I am so, so sorry. Do you have to go with men every night? When scripture says the Lord is close to the broken heart and saves those who are crushed in spirit, I've seen what it looks like to be crushed in spirit when you're 11 years old. So, this is our moment to be Christ in the flesh to those who are broken. Now, Betty, Sheila, and I watched that yesterday, and I said to Sheila, it's just almost impossible to imagine seeing something like that and then to think that men can be so depraved and so defeated that they could exploit a little innocent child like that for some kind of uh, attempted gratification. Or, dear God, it's, so, it's just such a sickness. And Lord, I just pray for the ones that are held by that grip and Lord, that would hurt a little innocent child. And then God in heaven, what we just pray for freedom. In Jesus' name, you know, Betty, we can't, uh, apart from God, set those men free. They just can be set free, but we can we can get that little girl out. We've we've been able to build rescue centers. We, you, all of us together, and right now we can we can rescue 2,500 that we're targeting. And we've had a group of friends say we'll match whatever's given. We can actually uh, reach uh, 5,000, and I'm just praying that everyone will help because. It takes $128 to rescue a child. Now that'll be doubled if you can do that. Somebody will match it and we rescue two. I'm just praying that people looking at that little girl would say, let me help someone like that because our viewers can Absolutely, can't. and you just listened to pure evil that's happening to these precious children. We have the opportunity now. We should not even hesitate. It should just be jumping out of our hearts then. We want to help. We want to help. James and I want to help. And I'm, I feel like you do too. Let's get the children out of the grasp of this evil. Let's give them a safe haven to go to, a safe place where someone's going to show them love, pure love, the pure love of Jesus Christ. So please join with us and let's help these precious little ones. You said we want to help. We're going to help. And let me just say this. We, we really committed ourselves to God that, Lord, we're going to do everything we can at every point. And would you please enable us? And you know, as we've gotten older, we don't retire a lot of our debts and things. We never had many. We, we, we always lived so far below our income that we just didn't get ourselves in trouble. And you enabled us to give, but we'd say, Lord, we want to do that. And let me just say this, 1,280, we can give it. And, and we can see 10, but now it's, now it's 20. In other words, that amount doubles. To reach them, to rescue them, and to restore them averages $128 a year. And it'll be double now. It's two children. Some of you say, I couldn't even do that, but 64 will now be doubled. You got another rescue. So at some level, you can help. We've got some gifts to send to you that'll bless you. But here's what you're doing. When you make that gift, when you go online, or you dial that number and you take your bank card and say, I'm going to rescue a child, it's going to be doubled. 
whatever you give, it's doubled. You are going to set someone totally free and enable the mission and relief workers to be the one who offers the hope and the healing that will not fail. You're providing it. Please, right now, would you give this great gift? Go online, dial the number, use that bank card like a check. If you write a check, make it to life. Thank you so much for doing it. We've got some gifts to send you that are going to bless you just to say thank you. And you're giving the greatest gift, a gift of love and a gift of life. Behind the bright lights, there is a darkness where a world of violence and sexual abuse runs rampant, scarring the souls of millions of young children. With their bodies broken and hopes crushed, these children are trapped in a never-ending nightmare. With your help, Mission Rescue Life can shine the light of God's love in this dark world to reach, rescue, and restore children and young people to the beauty God designed for them to enjoy. With a generous opportunity of a $320,000 matching gift, your gift of $128 to help rescue a child will be matched to help two children. Your $64 gift will be matched to help rescue one child from the horrors of human trafficking. And a $32 rescue gift will be doubled to $64. With your gift of any amount today, we'll send you the Names of God Prayer Journal. From Adonai to Yahweh, this journal is filled with beautiful photographs to help you reflect on 31 different names of God found throughout Scripture. With your gift of $128 or more, you'll receive the Names of God Bible. This special edition NIV large print Bible is engraved with the many names of God, a beautiful reminder that the God we serve is infinitely good. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,280, which will now help rescue 20 children, and you may request a beautiful Bridge of Faith frame canvas print by Thomas Kincaid. Please call, write, or make your gift online. These children are absolutely beautiful. They are filled with families that love them. Now, they're poor, and be just because they're poor, it puts them at terrible risk for being taken, for being kidnapped, for being trafficked and forced into labor or sex trafficking. And if they get taken, nobody's gonna know where to find them and people can't go after them and look for them. We don't wanna see that happen. Friends for Life is building a network with partners around the world so that children in these kind of conditions don't get trafficked, don't get taken away from their families. Won't you partner with us? I want you to pray and ask God what he would have you do. I want you to pick up your phone, I want you to go online, and I want you to be part of the Friends for Life to partner for rescue. Would you join me here in the audience and Betty saying thanks to Star Parker? <laughs> and bless you, Star, we love you. We're with you 100%. Thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. It was the time in my life when I felt God's grace most profoundly. Find out what slowed down the fastest American woman in history, Sonia Richards-Ross, next week. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.